This is the TED Health Podcast. I'm Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter. Today, I have the honor of welcoming Maria Shriver to the podcast. You may know Maria as an Emmy and Peabody award-winning journalist for her work as a special anchor for NBC News. You may have even read one of her seven New York Times bestselling books. But Maria is also the founder of the nonprofit, The Women's Alzheimer's Movement. And she's here today to talk to us about her work with the organization. Welcome, Maria. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here with you. In 2010, you started the Women's Alzheimer's Movement to redefine the narrative of the disease as a women's health issue. What drew you to this work? Well, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's back in 2003. So that began my odyssey, I think, to understand what was happening in the brain? How did that happen? Who did it happen to? And those questions led me to recognizing that more and more women seemed to be impacted by this and doctors telling me that it was only because they lived longer. And I didn't think that was the case. And so I partnered with the Alzheimer's Association and we reported out to the nation that this uh, disease discriminated against women. Two out of three cases belonged to women and two thirds of the caregivers were also women. So this is a women's health disease. If you have it, if you don't have it, if you're a caregiver, if you're the one impacted, and we wanted to try to understand what is happening in women's brains and bodies that makes them susceptible. You've recently partnered with the Cleveland Clinic, and you've been conducting a lot of research to better understand why Alzheimer's disproportionately impacts women. What are you learning there? Uh, We've been funding research for the last, I think, 10 years before we partnered with the Cleveland Clinic. We were the preeminent organization looking at women and Alzheimer's, looking at funding research into women's brains. They saw what we were doing and said, we need to get in on that. We need to partner with an organization that's already looking at perimenopause, looking at diet, that's looking at faith-based groups, looking at community. That's where we want to go. That's where the future is going. And I think the goal with the Cleveland Clinic is to elevate the amount of research. We have been giving out seed grants that result in over $80 million in matching grants. We fund a tremendous amount of female researchers, black and brown researchers who are studying women. So our goal is to try to raise more funds, look at, you know, having these prevention centers in different locations, putting them online, making telemedicine a part of that, because we want it to be affordable and accessible to all. For women of color who have higher rates of dementia compared to whites, this is just one example of uh, existing health inequity. How is the Women's Alzheimer's Movement addressing this? Well, we're focused on women because that's where the issue is. So we're studying Black women, Latino women, white women. The research shows that, you know, women, particularly women of color, do better when the doctor resembles them. So we need to have more doctors, more healthcare providers that look like their patients and making prevention accessible and affordable. So the Women's Alzheimer's Movement funds research, puts out information, it tries to build awareness. We started a prevention center, the first of its kind, for women several years ago with the Cleveland Clinic on the ground in Vegas. Because people said to me, well, we go to these summits, we listen to all of this, but where can I go? So we have now partnered with the Cleveland Clinic at large to try to bring our work to serve more women from all walks of life, particularly Black and brown women, and to try to understand what is happening in women's brains and bodies that makes them susceptible. It's so incredible. Thank you for doing this work. Have women connected with the narrative that Alzheimer's is a women's health issue? And what have you learned about women's perspectives on brain health? Well, first of all, this is a global issue. It's not just an American issue. And the Women's Alzheimer's Movement just did a poll that said an overwhelming majority of women do not know that this is a women's health issue. Women have not spoken to their health care provider about their cognitive health. Beyond hot flashes, uh, very few women know the other symptoms associated with perimenopause and menopause, which is a very critical time in a woman's life where her brain begins to change. What this new poll did was really shine a light that women are unaware of the broadness of their health journey. So much of the women's health conversation has focused on birth control or abortion 
breast cancer and heart disease a little bit, but we haven't had a holistic conversation so that women understand what might happen to them after they have a troubled pregnancy, whether they have hypertension or type 2 diabetes or they have depression, how that puts them on a ramp to neurological disease. So I'm hopeful that this will begin a broader conversation about the state of women's health, how empowered women can be, how much work there is to be done between the healthcare provider and the woman. And I'm hoping that more and more hospitals will begin to have women's health centers where women are treated holistically throughout the decades of their life. Certainly, when I was a young woman and going to my gynecologist, I never thought about myself at 40, 50, 60, 70. I never heard of Alzheimer's. I don't know if it's because I had a male doctor who didn't talk to me about perimenopause. I didn't ask because I just thought, oh, everything I was feeling was because of everything on my plate. And I didn't prioritize what I was feeling. Mm. And I was talking about this the other day at a table, and one woman said to me, well, where would I even go to talk to someone about my cognitive health? And I said, to your doctor. She's like, I didn't even know I could talk to my doctor. So we all have a responsibility to speak up and to ask. And, you know, sometimes you don't get the answers you want, or sometimes you don't get answers, and you just have to keep asking. And many people go like, well, I don't even want to know if I have Alzheimer's because like, there's nothing they can do to help me. But I'm all about trying to do everything that's available to you. And then, you know, it's in God's hands. Absolutely. When we don't have sex-based factors related to illness being studied, we don't get that data. So it's problematic for men too, for all of us. Can you talk about this a little bit? So much of the research in our country on everything has been done on men. And that's a disservice to men and to women, right? Most of the medication women take has been studied on men. There is a new movement underway to look at sex differences, to really parse out how does this particular disease manifest in a woman. And really to think about, as we now have people living longer, what is a holistic health journey? What's going on in a woman's life or a man's life? at 70, at 80? What do you need to do at 30 to be healthy at 60? So I think we're in a different place today, but our research has not caught up with where we are. And I think women need to advocate, not just for themselves, but for increased funding when it comes to women's health. They have to advocate with their healthcare provider. They have to advocate on behalf of their parents. Yeah. And I can say as a primary care doctor, it's very important that people speak up when they have concerns or things happen. Yeah. And if they're not getting those kinds of questions or that kind of care from their doctor. What this poll also showed is that so many women are caring either for a child or an elderly parent. So their health decisions takes a back seat for a long period of time. And I can honestly say that it's only after both my parents died and my kids became adults that I began to focus on my own health. And that's way too late. It is. It is way too late. But we know that a disproportionate amount of caregiving responsibility falls onto women. Caregivers tend to neglect their own well-being and, and focus on other people's health, leading to negative health effects like anxiety, depression, and other chronic illness. What would you like to see happen to change this? So this is a huge national issue, making businesses provide flexible work schedules so people working can go and take a parent to a doctor's appointment, letting the worker know that we understand all these competing responsibilities, having the government looking at caregiving tax credits. I spent a year and a half developing a plan for the state of California to look at how That state could better prepare for the onslaught of new Alzheimer's cases. And every state really needs to do that because we are an aging nation and we have a lower birth rate with an aging population. So the question of who will care for us is a fundamental issue, a fundamental value proposition for this country and really for the world. And I know since you're working in end-of-life issues, Alzheimer's and end-of-life issues are deeply connected now. We see kind of people who are having, getting Alzheimer's, forcing a conversation about what does the end of my life look like, having respect and dignity in that journey, what is the right way to go, who has authority over that. We're debating always who has authority over my body when I want to give birth, and who has authority over my brain and my body when I want to allow myself 
the gift of letting it go. It kind of forces us all, I think, to step back and go, who's to say what you want to do with your body, with your life, how you want to live it, how you want to end it? These are really big, my body, my choice discussions. And I don't think we've even begun to kind of crack the surface of them. But people should live their wildly authentic lives. And that's from as early as you can to to the end. Mm, That's beautiful. All of this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's other diseases with similarly disproportionate impacts on women. How can the progress that you've made on Alzheimer's maybe speed up similar research, prevention, education, advocacy around neurological disease and women's health on a larger scale? We need increased funding for women's health, period. And when we have increased funding, we could look at autoimmune diseases, the effect of birth control on the brain for long periods of time. Why are so many women suffering from anxiety and depression? The impact of SSRIs, the impact of taking medication like that and being pregnant. The big brain study the Cleveland Clinic launched is to look at healthy people's brains and to try to determine among men and women, where does the brain begin to change so that hopefully subsequent generations will be treated by their healthcare provider in a different manner when they go in at maybe 50, but we're not in that place now. We need to get there. The role of women changed the narrative altogether. When I got involved in Alzheimer's, it was only old men who get this, and it was a natural part of aging. The narrative is completely different. There are more people now researching than ever before. The technology in this space completely different. So there is a lot of hope, but people are impatient, as am I. So let's all get on board and try to understand how that happens and when we can intervene. People have kind of generally, like, I don't feel well, I'm tired, my foot hurts. And so it's kind of hard sometimes for doctors to go, well, you know, that could be so many things. And then 80% of all the autoimmune diseases are women. And so often they manifest as I'm tired or have uh, this suspicion that something's not right, but people can't put their finger on it. Something I do, I keep notes in my phone and I just keep adding to them. I woke up feeling this way. I had eaten X, Y, and Z the night before. Might that be connected? So I try to remind myself when I go to the doctor to ask these questions, because we forget that our eyes hurt when we're in the desert or that we get a pain here and there. We forget these things, right? Maria, what are your personal practices to maintain good health and reduce your personal risk of Alzheimer's? Well, you know, as my kids say, I say all these things and I don't actually do all these things. So what I do do is I meditate in the morning. And that's really in the last 10 years. I wish I had started that much earlier. I do exercise. I've always exercised. And I prioritize my sleep in a way I didn't used to. I find myself eating earlier. I've always struggled with a sweet tooth, but I'm much better. I've always struggled with putting the right food in my mouth. And I prioritize being in community, having purpose, having meaning. I prioritize my spiritual life. But I somehow find a French fry in my hand quite often. So I don't know. Hey, I'm a doctor and the same thing happens to me. Yes. (laughs) Maria, you're such an incredible advocate. Thank you so much for everything that you do and for having this conversation with me today. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening today. This episode was produced by Joanne DeLuna and fact-checked by Ted. And special thanks to Anna Phelan, Maria Lagius, Michelle Quint, and Colin Helms. I'm Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter. Stay well, and I'll talk to you next week.